Um, we're fortunate today to have a guest speaker uh, who I will uh, introduce momentarily. Of course, we uh, Tuesday started to discuss transnational crimes. This is a class on transnational issues, and we were talking about global crime. Uh, and I suggested that although our textbook tends to focus on things like smuggling and uh, drug traffic, uh, that the other category of crimes that needs to be paid attention to is political or war crimes. Uh, so um, our guest today will be speaking uh, to that topic. And uh, uh, let me introduce, we have uh, Steve Balch, uh, Professor Balch, uh, is the uh, director, director of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Uh, and his uh, institute is sponsoring the visit by Dr. John Fonte. Uh, Dr. Fonte is the author of Sovereignty or Submission, which has a chapter on the International Criminal Court. Uh, and this was a, a, a book award winner, as well as spent some time at the top of the Amazon uh, bestseller list. So, uh, it's, and uh, the reviews, I did look at the reviews on Amazon, and uh, the, the book is quite provocative and, uh, and uh, I think was well received. Uh, Dr. Fonte, uh, as you know, uh, has recently published an article in Foreign Affairs, the leading uh, uh, journal of foreign policy in the United States. Uh, and uh, he's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, he is uh, a graduate of the University of Chicago in world history. Um, and uh, he'll speak on uh, global governance and the challenge to liberal democracy. So let's welcome Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I was going to uh, focus a little bit on the International Criminal Court the ICC and sort of view, <coughs> view transnational politics um, <coughs> and transnational crimes, war crimes as we're talking about them, uh, <coughs> through the prism of the International Criminal Court, through the, through the ICC. Uh, as you probably know, we're read the uh, International Criminal Court is the first permanent uh, global court uh, to deal with war crimes and the idea for it uh, came out of at um, the end of World War II, uh, the Holocaust and the genocides, and uh, it was thought that um, these terrific war crimes, which were tried at Nuremberg, uh, which of course was the Allied countries trying uh, the German Nazi war criminals, it was thought, well, let's have a permanent court, let's have something stable rather than just the uh, victors at the uh, at the end of the war. So um, I'm going to uh, do three things here. Um, we're going to go back and see how the, first of all, how the International Criminal Court was, was, uh, <clears throat> was organized, how, how it came into being. So, um, and this is an example of how global laws, in a sense, are made. So that's number one. Uh, two, who were the people, institutions involved in the creation of the International Criminal Court? And three, what are the results of the International Criminal Court? Now, I'm sort of a critic, so uh, hopefully there'll be some supporters who can speak up lately, but I'll, I'll probably give it, this is a rather critical uh, view of the court because I think that there is a, a tremendous tension with, um, with liberal, liberal democracy and democratic accountability. Um, uh, the court was a result of negotiations um, finally entered in Rome, so it's called the Treaty of Rome. Um, there was a group of um, forces who were, that were at the UN treaty negotiation who were determined uh, to establish this permanent international court. And essentially there were, there were two groups. Um, um, one was, and they, they formed an alliance. The nation states were called the like-minded group, you know, in sort of UN speak. And these were countries like, uh, at the time, the Netherlands, Canada, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Argentina, and South Africa. Uh, there were 15 countries in this like-minded group. Uh, then, um, also present at the negotiations uh, were a variety of human rights uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, particularly uh, Human Rights Watch 
Amnesty International, and a group is now called Human Rights First. It's, it was the time it was called the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. So they were they were there as well. Um, and, all, and of course, the United States was present. This is in the 90s. So uh, the United States sent Ambassador Schieffer. He was this is a, the Clinton administration. So he was a representative of the Clinton administration uh, negotiating uh, for the United States at the uh, at the hearing. So this this. These negotiations went on for about three years. Uh, and the arguments were the following. Um, the like-minded group, that's these, these groups, the Germans, the French, and the Dutch, not so much the French, but the Dutch and, and uh, some of these other groups, wanted to establish a permanent court with universal jurisdiction. Universal, I mean, they could take a case anywhere, and they could decide what the cases were. And it would not have to go through the Security Council, or anything like this. this uh, technically, under international law, the Security Council is uh, is responsible for war and peace and international law. And if there's a <coughs> something that qualifies as international law, it's supposed to be related to security, <coughs> it's supposed to get the approval of the Security Council. <coughs> and the United States delegation um, said, it, headed by Ambassador Schieffer, I wanted that. That was one of their. Uh, Demands or one of the American positions was we want this to go to the Security Council. Of course, the United States had a veto in the Security Council, and they would like any action of this international court then to get the approval of the Security Council. Um, well, it turned out that the um, United States did not get its way in the formation of the International Criminal Court, um, and so what was formed was a permanent. It was a, a treaty. Um, so today, there's over over 100 countries, uh, and they agreed by, to abide by these rules. And if there was a, and they would uh, prosecute uh, for uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and crimes uh, of aggression. So those were the sort of the four crimes. Um, and the authority to prosecute would be if a crime was committed on a member state, on the territory of a member state. Uh, they wouldn't need Security Council approval. Security Council could independently vote for an ICC investigation. But if, if this crime was committed on a member, on the territory of a member state, and the determination if there was a war crime or with or whether to proceed with an investigation was not dependent on the Security Council, it was dependent upon the, the, the International Criminal Court itself. There was the prosecutor. He would bring a case, but then it would be the judges. They would form a pre-trial chamber before the trial, and they would decide at the pretrial chamber whether there was enough evidence to proceed. At that point, if they proceeded, there would be, uh, then there would be a trial. So this, was, this is what they were arguing about. The like-minded group and the NGOs uh, won, and, and the Clinton administration did not get what it wanted. It didn't get the Security Council veto. It didn't get the, the types of things that it won. Now, what is, what is sort of this is, but this is transnational politics. It's very interesting, because Traditionally, in, in treaty negotiations, there are, you know, the United States would negotiate with Russia about arms control. You do this, we'll do that. If you uh, break the rules, we'll leave the treaty. Uh, so there were nations uh, who were accountable uh, to their uh, to other nations, and, and that's how treaties usually did. With human rights treaties, uh, present not only are the members of the nation, uh, members of the nation states, but there's a large numbers of, of non-governmental organizations who, of course, are not accountable to a nation, or they're accountable to their, their members. Um, so the interesting process here was there were a lot of NGOs, many of them American citizens who were participating in this process, but the like-minded group um, would present a, a program, a policy. The United States would counter with a position paper by, written by the American diplomats, and then the American position paper, and there's one instance of specifically happening, it was rebutted by uh, Human Rights First, it's now called, the then it was the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. They should call it Human Rights First for convenience sake. So Human Rights First submitted the, <laughs> the counter paper to the American position. But the person writing it was an American citizen. So that's transnational, right? So you had the light, there were many American citizens there from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and so on. But they were not work, they were working against the position of the Clinton administration and in favor of a like-minded group allied with Argentina, South Africa, uh, the Dutch, and, uh, and so on. So 
that is totally, that's somewhat new, that's, that's not international politics so much in politics between nations, but transnational uh, politics among nations. So that was, uh, that was part of the process. So the U.S. Service, they got outvoted by the nations, and when, when it finally passed, there was tremendous uh, cheering for 30, 40 minutes. There's a couple of books on the, how the ICC was uh, passed. So this was, in other words, they were, uh, the United States and India, which also objected, uh, submitted some amendments, last minute amendments, where we defeated. Okay, so that's, that's the pro how, the, how, the, how the treaty was created, a combination of middle-sized nation states, uh, with NGOs. The interesting thing about this is almost all of these, except with the exception of Britain and France, all these middle-sized nation states are states, nations that are actually not involved in war too often. The countries involved, the countries that are involved actually would be doing fighting and might be involved in possible war crimes or, or actually concerned with uh, with war, uh, were not actually did not did not in the end adhere to the ICC. That would be the United States. Israel, India, Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, uh, nations that have Syria, nations that are actually democratic countries and obviously non-democratic countries. Or so it was countries more of a passive advance plus the, <coughs> the NGOs, like Germany, that's not bound too much. And where they did do some good stuff in, in the Balkans, um, uh, was involved. Well, okay, anyway, that, that's how, that was the process of, that was the, my first point. Um, the second, and this ties to the whole question of uh, probably one of my, a major critique by different people of the ICC, um, is that who was involved in the process and who were they accountable to and so on. I'm going to read a bunch of names of the key players of the participants in the ICC treaty. I'll tell you what, and then you're going to raise your hand if you've heard of them. You've heard, you know, you're, you're a student, this is a class on uh, <coughs> transnational issues, so you may know some of them. May not. Okay, Adrian Bose, that's spelled B-O-S. How many people have heard of Adrian Bose? Nobody. Uh, he was a, um, a Dutch diplomat and the first chairman of the Committee of the Whole, key player. He got sick and he was replaced by Felipe Kirsch. How many of you have heard of him? Nobody in the room. He's a Canadian diplomat. He, was, he took over the chairmanship of the Committee of the Whole. He steered the treaty through. Felipe Kirsch. If James Madison is the father of the American Constitution, Felipe Kirsch is the father of the International Criminal Court. Sharif Bassouni. Nobody's heard of him. See the hands raising. He was the chairman of the drafting committee that actually wrote the document. Uh, at the time, he was a he's emeritus now. He was a law professor at Duke. I'm sorry, at DePaul University in Chicago. Law professor at DePaul. <coughs> he's not, he was an American citizen, naturalized. American citizen born in Egypt, but he got a job. He was on the committee. He was able to write it because he represented Egypt. He represented a nation state. He read as represented Egypt, always American citizen. Now remember, he went through the naturalization process. When you go through the national naturalization process, as you've seen in that, you, you take an oath. I absolutely and entirely renounce all allegiance to any foreign state, prince, potentate, of whom or which I have previously been a subject or a citizen. So he was. Uh, <laughs> American citizen, he had renounced Egypt, and he's representing Egypt at this conference. Um, the other people were, uh, well, Bose represented the Netherlands, and Kirsch represented Canada. So those were, they, they re did represent nation state. William R. Pace, how I many of you have heard of him? Nobody. Pace is, they had the coalition of NGOs for the International Criminal Court, American citizen. Uh, Richard Dicker, nobody's heard of him. Uh, he was an uh, American citizen, leader of Human Rights Watch at the uh, at the conference um, uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> he participated in, as in the negotiations, uh, writing, and, and uh, so on. Um, Christopher Keith Hall, he was a British citizen. He represented Amnesty International. I think. So these are the people that created it. Um, <clears throat> now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a bunch of other names to see if you've heard of these people. Uh, Barack Obama, <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, John Boehner, Eric Cantor, Harry Reid, Mitch Kahn, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, so what's my point? Anybody, you can, I can ask her. Uh, anyone have an idea what my point is? Why I bothered to read all those other names and then read these other names? 
This was drafted by people who were relatively unknown by the American public, I suppose. Uh, yes, uh, that's getting it. Yeah, exactly. This was this is how the uh, <coughs> treaties are made under a certain type of transnational process. And the other one is how uh, laws are made. Well, the first case, the treaty is a law, so it's global. This is how global laws are made, or can be made. Who makes them? Um, and uh, the second part is obviously how uh, the people that make laws in, uh, in a constitutional democracy, uh, you know who they are. You can elect them or re-elect them. Some have been re-elected. Uh, some will not be, some are, and so on. Uh, you, can, you can approve or disapprove. Uh, you cannot approve or disapprove of Sharif Kasuni or uh, Philip Kirsch. You can't elect them. You know, now we have an international criminal court. If changes were to be made in the global laws of the International Criminal Court, uh, how would they, how could they be, uh, you know you can do it a lot, you can repeal the law. Even a constitutional amendment, uh, prohibition was repealed. Was repealed. Uh, other laws can be repealed, or they can be extended, and so on. How would you repeal uh, the international, the Treaty of Rome, create an international court? You'd have to call another conference. Remember, the last one lasted uh, three or four years, so you'd have to start the whole process again. So that's, I guess, the difference between global governance and governance within a um, a nation-state democracy. That's sort of the process question. I want to talk also a minute about um, uh, some of the substance questions. Um, couple of substance questions. The substance is, um, well, I'll finish one, one more point on process, uh, because uh, this, is, this has to do with how war crimes are prosecuted, and then that's the third, the final thing is to look at is what is actually a war crime, because there's, there's a dispute on everything. Um, so how, um, a war crime, you would be subject to the International Criminal Court if a crime or alleged crime is committed on the soil of a country that signed the treaty. And, those pe and the, the countries that sign the treaty are the people that appoint the judges. So it's the, they're the party to the treaty. So there's about 120 countries. So let's say that, um, and the, some countries that didn't sign it, prominent countries would be India, uh, would be prominent, uh, the Czech Republic, probably the only country in Europe. Let's say that um, there are Indian troops and a UN peacekeeping mission, they're in the Congo, the Congo signed uh, the treaty. There was some, something happened and it looked, some people thought there was a human right, the human rights group was there, human rights watch was there, they said there's a violation of human rights committed by Indian troops. This is committed on the soil of um, um, a treaty party, so it's, it's the, the ICC can investigate this. Same thing would happen in Afghanistan is a, is a member of the treaty, the United States is not. So if the United States American soldier did something in Afghanistan, they would technically be under the ICC. The supporters of the ICC says, well, there's a safeguard, it's called complementarity, that the, the country uh, who's accused, the country whose soldiers are accused, India, let's say, uh, can have its own trial, or the United States, so say, yes. okay, let's say they have their own trial. The soldier is acquitted. At that point, the ICC pre-trial chamber judges can say, well, you have this trial, but this was, uh, this was phony, you were either unable or unwilling, that's the term, that's the term of the treaty, unwilling or unable to prosecute. So uh, that was an invalid, uh, invalid treaty, an invalid trial, I'm sorry. So we're gonna do our own trial. So in other words, the final authority on whether there is a trial would be in the hands of the ICC. So there are several democratic countries that are not involved. The United, uh, United States, Israel is not a party. India is not a party. The Czech Republic. Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim democracy, uh, is not a party. The Philippines is not a party. Uh, but there are many dictatorial countries in the International Criminal Court. They appoint the judges. So you have a situation where um, the judges from a dictatorship like Tajikistan or Chad or the Congo are trying the soldiers of a democracy like Israel or India, Czech Republic or the United States uh, in the treaty. So I'm not saying that the International Criminal Court is a good idea that it's very hard to put into practice. I'm saying it's actually bad in ideas also because it's, it's a challenge to democracy and, and it directly challenges uh, liberal democrat democracy and, and democratic authority. Um, okay, that's, that's some of the, uh, uh, those are some of the um, procedural questions. On the substantive questions, the crimes are uh, war crimes, 
crimes against humanity, genocide, and crimes of aggression, in which the leaders of the country, like Hitler attacked Poland, so he would be responsible for crimes of aggression. Um, so let's look at um, what are crimes of aggression. Now, um, they didn't put that in the they didn't put that in the first the first round. That was put out for ten years. The ICC went into effect in 1992. It was a Kampala conference, um, 2010, I guess it was. The uh, United States was there as an observer. This is the Obama administration because uh, we're not a member, but there as an observer. And the United States again argued on. First of all, they said, "Don't put aggression. Don't put aggression in." because uh, it's, it's too complicated. And, uh, <clears throat> but they decided to do this anyway. Then, okay, what is aggression? Aggression was anything um, that was not direct self-defense if you were attacked. So a naval blockade, which John F. Kennedy uh, did in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, that could be a crime of aggression. Um, any kind of bombardment and area attack, aerial attack. So Clinton's bombing of uh, Yugoslavia, or uh, Obama's drone attacks, or, or uh, Bush's bombing in Afghanistan. Any of these acts, any bombing raids could be considered um, as an act of aggression if the other side hasn't attacked you first. And that was the case in Yugoslavia. Uh, these were, so this, this, uh, any, time, any type of commando raid, a raid that captured bin Laden, could be, a, that's, that's an aggression. You're going into an enemy, you're not an enemy, it's Pakistan but you're going into a foreign country without their permission, carrying out people, this could be technically be aggression. There's no definition. It's if aggression would be a grievous violation, a manifest violation of the human charter. But they don't define it. It was deliberately not defined. Uh, so all of these are in the, so the United States was fairly nervous, but what happened uh, is that they got what we call op ops in international relations, international affairs. So, they, these, these were all listed as crimes of aggression, or I mean, they all they accepted the principles of what the International Criminal Court was saying, but they put off any implementation for 10 years. And this would not apply to any nation that did not sign the treaty, so the United States, or did not ratify the treaty. So the United States, even if the crime commit, was committed on a member of a state, so that negated. And also, even if you joined, you could opt out of this provision. So, and it has to be voted again in 10 years. So they, they did all this series of opt-outs to sort of say, well, the U.S. wouldn't be directly involved. But they've established a principle, the principle that aggression will be determined not as it is currently in international law, not by the Security Council of the United Nations, which is the current determiner, but by the, uh, the, uh, in the prosecutor of the uh, International Criminal Court approved by the judge of the International Criminal Court. So he had sort of a, a global special prosecutor who can decide now what an act of aggression is. Uh, also decide what a war crime is. And all of these things are open to discussion. You think a war crime would be fairly simple, uh, what the Nazis did in World War II. Uh, no, um, the International Criminal Court is following um, uh, another international law, pro additional protocol one of uh, of the Geneva Conventions, which has a, uh, this was created in the 19, it's not the, the one that came after World, right after World War II in 1949. It's in 1977, a new set of rules on human rights and, and the laws of war, called International Humanitarian Law, these were called the laws of war, were established um, by conference in 1977. It's called Additional Protocol One, and these new laws were set up to sober favor uh, guerrillas and uh, irregular forces. It was during the time of the struggle in South Africa and uh, in Palestine and Israel, so this was an attempt to help irregular forces pushed by uh, the developing nations, Group of 77, and the Soviet bloc against the West, but it did pass. Uh, here's an example. Under new international law, uh, in the old international law, you had to be, uni had to be in uniform to be a legitimate combatant in the war. Um, and you had to have a regular order and so on, be in uniform, you're in army. And the new ones, you don't have to be in uniform, and you can be in civilian clothes, you can have a hidden weapon and be in a crowd. At that point, you're a civilian. Uh, you jump out of the crowd, get your weapon out, fire at the conventional forces, the American or the Israeli or British over there. At that point, you're in combat, you're a combatant. They can fire back at you at that point. If the, uh, 
the insurgent or terrorist, whatever you want to call him, jumps back into the crowd. He's a civilian at that point. And then at that point, the command orders can't shoot him. Of course, you'd be endangering civilians anyway, so he's endangering civilians. You can't shoot him, because that would be murder here as a civilian. And they can't come and arrest him, or they have to, they did, have to be a domestic crowd, because that person at that point is a civilian. So that's one of the, one of the provisions. Uh, I'll mention one other, one other provision. Um, this came up directly from the U.S. Uh, war in Yugoslavia. This is, and it came up from Israel's war in Gaza. And this is, um, you're supposed to warn, before an air attack, you're only supposed to attack military targets. So you're supposed to warn, what if there's civilians in the area? Remember World War II, bombing of Tokyo, killed thousands of civilians, bombing of uh, Berlin, Hamburg was totally destroyed. I don't know, remember it, but you've seen movies and so on. Um, so with this new idea coming out of the 1977 treaty, held now by most countries in the world, it's, it, you, have to, you have to warn civilians in the area if there's going to be an imminent attack. Okay. Um, so the United States, um, during the Yugoslav conference, the Clinton administration in 1999, bombed the um, uh, the uh, radio station in Belgrade, which they said was putting out propaganda for the Milosevic regime, so they, they bombed the station. And they killed a few civilians. They did not warn civilians in advance. So that's so it was a violation of Protocol 1. So Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International said, well, this is American, this is a major war crimes. They're committing possible war crimes, bombing, a violation of Protocol 1. The U.S., of course, is not a party to Protocol 1. They're saying, yeah, but this was a NATO bombing, and Many NATO countries are, and this is Protocol One is now part of customary international law. So they should have been following, even though they have, the United States should have been following, even though they, have, uh, they didn't adhere to the treaty. Uh, it turns out they didn't. This was came before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which they, they didn't want to proceed. But the fact the issue came forward, and then we we go, going to turn to Gaza in 2009. Israel made a series of attacks in the uh, attacking Hamas. Uh, in, in, in Gaza, and they actually did warn people in the area, but it wouldn't, it was, uh, uh, there was a warning that the Israelis would say there, it's going to be a warning, you know, between, let's say, 15th Street and 35th Street, uh, there's going to be an attack coming, so civilians should leave there. Uh, so they made the attacks. But then the, the UN Human Rights Council cre had created a commission, um, a lot of the ICC, a lot of these NGOs were involved, and they was, the, out of this came the Goldstone Report, as uh, you may remember, and they said, well, Israel was not in war crimes, and uh, Goldstein, Goldstone later retracted it, but at the time of the report, he said, well, yes, Israel did warn them that an attack was coming, but they didn't give the time, and they didn't say where. Uh, so if you were in the, you were the Secretary of Defense of the country, the United States, Whatever. What? How would you react to this? I mean, what uh, should an air force give a warning to civilians in the area that an attack is coming? Are there pros and cons? There's a comment from somebody. Anyone? The obvious con would be you're, you're telling the enemy where and where you're going to attack so they can leave the area. I mean, a pro, you're saving lives that aren't involved. But right, so what would be your choice? I don't know, if I was a military leader, I wouldn't say anything, because that's your job to win whatever war or whatever okay. that you're involved in. Yeah, so those are some of the complications. And um, one of the problems with the International Criminal Court is it's uh, originally holding on to, it's, it's viewing additional protocol one as international law, even though a central point of international law is state consent. Things have to say we agree this is international law. In this case, uh, most of the war fighting states in the world have not agreed to Protocol One. That's the United States, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, uh, Israel, uh, Philippines, which is doing a lot of guerrilla fighting. So many of the war where countries that are not involved in conflict have agreed to this, and then democratic countries haven't, and some undemocratic countries. So there's there's <coughs> there's a problem. Um, so there are, there are many, there are those different problems then that I find with the International Criminal Court is uh, the process was uh, created, the treaty was created basically by unaccountable 
many, there are many uncountable actors. <coughs> Nation states are accountable, but there are all these other people that weren't, are not really accountable uh, democratically. Uh, then the, the structure of the court, you have sort of this global special prosecutor who's contained only by the court itself, only by the judges of the court. Uh, so it circumvents uh, regular international law, which is security is supposed to go through the Security Council of the United Nations. So all of those procedures. Now the democratic question, you have uh, many non-democracies uh, serving as judges and, and being able to appoint judges to deal with, uh, with democratic states. Um, it's not a trial then by your peers. Uh, if you're a soldier in America or Israel or the Czech Republic or India, it's, it's, uh, uh, you could have judges who, uh, who do not share uh, your values. So, but there are many people who, um, who believe that this is, so I'm saying it's a systemic problem with the IC, with the International Court. It's not simply just a good idea that it's utopian and hard to work out in practice. And we see what's happened. There are almost all the trials have been in Africa. Um, recently there was a, uh, uh, situation in Kenya where they're, gonna, they're going to go ahead with what they call war crime in Kenya. And what was this was election violence in Kenya. So there were two groups, <coughs> two parties, but they had, uh, you know, they had strong arm supporters and they would beat up. So things that used to happen in Democrat, sometimes and still do, in democratic countries and a few people were killed, free people. So this was Apparently a job for the ICC, but the ICC, the International Criminal Court, was created to deal with the most egregious crimes. We're talking about Auschwitz and Nuremberg, and not a Kenyan election struggle that killed three people. So Kenya has the Parliament part Kenya's voted to get out to withdraw from the International Criminal Court. They said you've only had trials in Africa, so that's all you're interested in prosecuting. Um, and then this is an election dispute within a country that, you know, it went bad, but it's not it's not an egregious war crime. But this, these are the kind of, this is the cases that, uh, well, that's their current case, and, and they, they did, I think, convict one person. It was a low-level person in an African state. Uh, the, the Sudan, uh, the dictator Bashir, is, they've had a warrant out for him for years, but of course they don't have enforcement power. Maybe that's a good thing. They don't have enforcement power. So uh, there is a push, however, the American Bar Association, the leading group of American lawyers, really, is, uh, this last year was a year it was called How to Promote the International Criminal Court. They're working for American participation in the International Criminal Court. And that's, that's a goal this year of the American Bar Association. Uh, so my discussion here was how I would refute that. And, uh, there's, I don't think it's going to happen because there isn't that type of support. In the Senate, there are all these questions. And remember, the Bush administration withdrew it. The Clinton administration opposed it. Well, they tried to get what they wanted, but the last minute they decided to sign it just in case things would improve. Uh, then the Bush administration under Ambassador Bolton um, sent the signature back, says we are not going to join the court, so you can forget the signature. Because once you sign a treaty, uh, you're sort of morally <coughs> obligated not to undermine it. So we do want to undermine it, so that's why we're sending this letter that we officially withdrew draw from the court. So the United States withdrew. Then when they had this Kampala conference, the Obama administration sent representatives to try to try to talk particularly to the Europeans and try to soften this crime of break, not have it in in the first place if possible, and then to soften it. And they were unsuccessful they did get their opt-outs. So that's sort of where we stand. And uh, uh, anyway, as you can see, that's 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 how uh, what I want to clarify this to my view some of the criticism, and I think I can stop there. Uh, we have, I guess, some time. I would like to ask you to sort of broaden this a bit. Yes. Uh, because you're your thesis, as I understand it, is that these instant, this transnational governance or global right. governance right. Uh, and transnational politics are in considerable tension with the requisites of constitutional democracy in a nation state. And so it's not just about the international criminal No, no, it's just one thing. Exactly. So um, maybe you could broaden your discussion and say, you know, maybe give us a couple of examples of other yeah. organizations that you think also have these problems that you've identified with the ICC. Uh, yes. Um, one would be uh, the World Trade Organization. Um, for after World War II, um, the, the um, the leading powers did not want to create a more a freer trade uh, 
world. Uh, um, and a lot of the blame for, um, you know, there was a depression in 1929, and, and countries practiced protectionism at that point. They set up high tariffs and really stifled international trade, so this was a negative thing for international trade. It led to a lot of hostility. Um, it's called economic nationalism. And so um, the countries wanted to avoid that after the, the, the process. After World War II, there was a conference in Bretton Woods, uh, outside of Washington, well, in Washington, in D.C. actually, uh, the leading economic powers of the world. And so how do we set up this world economic system after World War II so we don't have this these problems of protectionism that we had in the 1930s, which everybody agrees were very damaging and so on. So how, how do we do it? So they set up a, an organization called GAS, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. <coughs> um, and it was multinational, all these countries could join, and they, <coughs> but it was negotiation, it was a political, political instrument, and uh, uh, international, between nations. Um, so many countries joined and they would agree to cut tariffs. Uh, they would look at different products and, and GATT lasted until the 1990s. And the GATT actually was a tremendous success. It cut uh, tariffs by about 90%. And it was done um, nation to, you know, multinational, but nation to nation, just politically. It wasn't a judicial process. So they had something, actually, in my view, was working very well, it was very good, fostered free trade. It was done nation to nation politically. Then, in sort of the 90s, there was this big push for global. There was, you know, globalization everywhere. But there was more, more of a push for integration. This is sort of when the euro was created. Um, <coughs> we have single currency for all of Europe. This is when the negotiations worked the International Criminal Court. They said, well, we need something more than the gap. We need sort of a judicial process where uh, countries could uh, maybe. There's a trade problem. You could bring a suit against another country and, and uh, sort of have a universal court. So they founded the World Trade Organization. And within the World Trade Organization is the, the AB, the appellate body, which is sort of their judicial body. Um, and at the current time, only nations can bring suits. So if China is doing something the U.S. doesn't approve of, it, uh, they can bring a case against China before the, uh, before the appellate body is Okay, so far, so the one problem, one thing that's sort of a problem is it's now judicial. The dispute, the, the dispute process before that used to be about international politics, nation to nation, that's, uh, and that worked pretty well. Now you're bringing in judges and saying, well, this is a judicial question, not just simply a, a political question. <clears throat> now we've had some cases that are almost totally written by corporations. It's not the nation will bring the suit. No, they're bringing it for the corporations. So now we have, when that's happened, we have a group of lawyers and judges in the World Trade Organization who are now in contact with these business constituencies who are forming, and they're, they're sort of forming their own, um, <coughs> they're born ideas on how to proceed. <coughs> now at this point, there is not yet what I call a problem of transnational overreach. <coughs> but there could very well be if the judges, and there's some talk of this, decide to take a case directly from a corporation against a country and perhaps overthrow, at least a democratic country, and overthrow the laws that were developed in that country on the basis of a treaty decision. So that could happen, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but there's a precedent for this. This is what happened, I'll talk about this a little bit tonight, this is happened with the European Union. Um, that was originally supposed to be just a union of what was called the European Community in the beginning, a group of nation states, and the nation states would be the final determiners of authority. But there again, there were a bunch of cases, and a lot of them were, were cases that made sense. The restrictions of trade and so on. They were brought before the European Court of Justice, which was this court of, um, which was the European Court, and they sort of established authority over the nation states. They said, you can nullify an act of parliament. So they sort of acted like Marbury Madison in the United States. And, and establish the judicial supremacy. So that could happen in the World Trade Organization. That's just another, another example. I'll give you, should I give you one more from domestic policy or should we break the questions? Or, no. uh, they start to blow up so they can get a question. Okay. Yeah. Let's get one question. Let's get a question. 
anyone? Jimmy. <coughs> so with, with, with regards to the ICC, yeah. how can it be enforced or, you know, and not be, and be incorruptible with little no oversight by any governmental entity besides the, you know, with the fact that, you know, you have both democratic and dictatorships that are involved. How can you keep that as being incorruptible without even the oversight of even the UN? Right. Um, well, it's the, the authority for the ICC comes from the members. So I think probably countries that are in 150 or something. So they set up the authority, they set up the administrative process, the judges, the chief of prosecutors, the chief of judges. So it's a treaty body and they, they, they run it themselves. Um, so that's, I mean, you're right, there's no outside, there's a mix of democratic and undemocratic. So I would sort of essentially agree with the premise of the country. On enforcement, the enforcement would have to come, the, the ICC has no police authority, or the enforcement would have to come from nation states. Uh, like this last year, the dictator of Sudan has been indicted. Uh, so he's supposedly incumbent upon members of the ICC if, to pick him up if they have a chance to arrest him and to turn him over to the ICC in The Hague in the Netherlands. That hasn't happened yet. And he, uh, I don't know if he came to the United States or not to the UN because he could have immunity. That, that. So they did arrest one, of the, one official in Africa some people, uh, the Kenyans agreed to turn themselves in for a trial, they thought they'd win a trial, but now they're, they're not so sure. Um, <clears throat> so there's, you know, some of them voluntarily surrendered to them. It's not happen too often. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I essentially agree with the presence of that. Any other points? Or do, you, uh, do you think that there should be a, uh, a kind of global or international? Yeah, that's a very good question that usually get asked. And, uh, um, I, don't, I don't see how it could be done. Uh, I'm sure it had to be done probably through the Security Council or some, there should be some, even that would be sort of unfair in a way to find the United States. It would be unfair if you're India you're, or, or Czech Republic or a democracy, but you're not. You don't have veto power, you have to depend on, on the U.S. or something. Um, and the other way, sort of the old-fashioned way, is, is uh, the great powers, if there was, I mean, that's what happened in Nuremberg, um, which actually technically was not an internet. Technically, um, this was a, a German domestic trial because Germany had surrendered and had lost its sovereignty, and German sovereignty was taken over by the Allied powers, the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, assumed German sovereignty. So the crimes against humanity were, uh, the basis for it was under, you know, this was a crime under German law. Uh, they were exercising sovereignty for Germany. Now, aggression was different. It was a, the attack on Poland, the attack on France, and so on. Uh, but so part of it was the seen as sovereignty. But your question, that's a very good one, and I guess I'm somewhat ambiguous. I guess I'd say no. And I'm, at this point, I can't think of it. I'd rather see it done by great powers than if, if there's a really, there's a real genocide going on in Sudan. And you really want to stop this guy, then you send in troops and you get them. Uh, and the African Union wasn't quite strong enough to do this. They were thinking of it. They had some forces. Uh, if this is serious with the West, then, then this thing you have to, to lose some soldiers. And this is humanitarian intervention. So that's another issue. That's, that's another sort of slightly political issue. There's R2P now, responsibility to protect, which you've heard about, which is a <coughs> an aspiration of the United Nations when something happens horribly, like in Rwanda or in, uh, uh, in Bosnia, then the countries have a responsibility to protect. Of course, it's still up to the country whether they're going to commit themselves. So, um, uh, but I, I don't, a permanent court, I'm sure not for universal jurisdiction, which means they can uh, act anywhere, because it looks like this is, these are the people who have been running it. Uh, would be the type, would be the people who attended the, the Rome conference or involved in negotiation, would be those international lawyers. Uh, and they would have a problem, I have a problem with the process. I mean, how, how they should do it and how the court should be set up. And with substance, what is a war crime? Well, I don't personally think that you have to warn, you should be, have to warn civilians before an air attack. You're going to endanger your own airmen. That's your first responsibility uh, is to, uh, the responsibility of the President of the United States is to uh, 
It's to the citizens of the United States. That's primary responsibility. So no, we wouldn't have to warn uh, people are not having these drone attacks or snow burning. And they occasionally they do make mistakes, which is unfortunate. And we should try to limit it as much as possible. But um, the other side, the consequence is, is more of a problem. This is my view. Okay. Yes. Um, you brought up an excellent point uh, when you mentioned that most of the uh, the ICC mostly has dealt with uh, crimes that occur in Africa, and that um, especially in countries who are going through a conflict where their where their where their nation's government, their national sovereignty is being questioned, where there is a dispute or a civil war going on, like in uh, Libya or. Syria or in Egypt, possibly you have these countries which you do not know who the uh, who the main authority is and who is part who is mainly responsible for these uh, these war crimes being committed because at the time um, so much violence is going on and the country's sovereignty is in question itself. So in those types of situations where you have a nation who's you are not sure who is in control anymore, like a uh, perfect example would be Somalia has no national. How do you pick? who to punish in those situations. Well, exactly. That's, that's, in fact, that's going on now in Libya. The International Criminal Court would like to try uh, Gaddafi's son, and the new government, such as it is, and Libya would like to try the son themselves. They say, well, we're sovereign, we just overthrew Gaddafi. As we can see, there's a lot of problems with the street mob and so on. So that's the question. The ICC says, well, you can't really do this. You don't have firm authority. The ICC is looking for cases to legitimize itself, so they would like to try Gaddafi's son. Uh, the government, the new government of Libya would like to try them, and that's that's exactly what we're talking about. It's a current, and there's a lot of chaos in Libya, obviously. And the other, the other thing um, that uh, the ICC, um, the other problem with it is, um, is the whole question of reconciliation in the country. A lot of times when there's been a dictatorship, this happened in South Africa, it's happened in some South American countries. And they want to <coughs> deal with the past, but and they want a reckoning of what's going on, but they don't want a, a permanent civil war where people hate each other for years. You're, you killed our relatives, and we're going to try to get you. So they've had these, these sort of confession and recon, reconciliation processes where they, they give amnesty to people. Can come forward, yes, I was the head of the secret police. I tortured 50 people. I killed your relatives. Um, and they were then given amnesty. They aren't tried, but people know what happened. And um, they want to move on, I guess. And the country as a whole wants to put this behind them, and they might there. So they, uh, there's these truth and Recon truth commissions, truth and reconciliation commissions, and that's what they did in South Africa. Um, the ICC is opposed to that. The ICC, the first prosecutor, Moreno Campo of Argentina, the first ICC prosecutor, said, "No, and what's important is justice. And for the other people, what's important is peace." Uh, he said, no, it's more just justice, we'll get this war criminal, we'll try him, that's it. Like in, in Sudan or something. People say, no, the country's a mess, it's, it's, we, want, we, we don't want, if you pursue injustice, you have a trial, this will just continue the problems. Uh, we've had a truth commission, we, this is the purpose of this, is to bring peace to the country, we want peace and tranquility, we don't want this trial. So that's another tension between so those people who want to close the book. I mean, have the truth, have everything out there, but then, um, have peace in the country and the others who want, you know, sort of justice at all costs. And this is, um, you know, you can see this continuing. You can see, I mean, you think of the American uh, Civil War and right after Reconstruction. How long, I mean, it, <clears throat> so the, Ameri the North occupied the South for 12 years. It was a military occupation. They, uh, you know, broke the, the old sort of planter class and there were many blacks and some who entered the Congresses and the Southern states. and. Uh, but they were occupiers there for 12 years, and people in the North sort of got tired of it. How long did this military occupation going to last? The other people said, you know, we want peace, we want you to leave, and so it doesn't last forever. They left, and some segregation was then put in place, and so on. So um, these are sort of the tensions. I mean, it, it's always going to, there's no solving this problem. It's just permanent tensions between sort of the pursuit of an act, absolute justice and and, and uh, peace. But in the case of the ICC, I think it's not absolute justice, what we're talking as I said, about uh, political riots in, in Kenya, which is not, does not level, it's not the level of, uh, of Auschwitz and what they were talking about in the trials. It's not a level, even though that was the explicit purpose. Uh, 
So there's, yeah, there's problems with um, a lot of international law in general. There's something called, we talk about customary international law, and, which is there's international law from treaties. We do this, you do that. That's one form. Another is customary, just long-term things that people have always done, states have always done through state practice. What states have actually done. For example, you don't kill each other's ambassadors. And when the founding fathers of the United States said we follow the law of nations, that's what they meant. We don't kill ambassadors. We do what civilized countries do. Uh, so that was the, the origins of customary international law. Recently, in the last, since again, the 1990s, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, there's a discussion of customary law is not what countries do, but what they say they will do. So if 200 countries sign a declaration, we are you know, for human rights or something like this, and that's customary international law. Where under traditional customary law, they would actually have to be practicing it. It's not just being aspirational. So that's another sort of, I have, I have a chapter on that in the book, it's another, I have a chapter on Israel, which I think is under tremendous pressure from these uh, transnational forces. So those are some of the things I'm covering. I cover, I cover some domestic treaties as well. Um, is there any other we have a question at this point? They've all got questions now, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you give me, when do we stop? Is it 3.15? 3.20. Okay. The end of the uh, um, I can give you a domestic example. And let's have one question, and then I'll go to a domestic politics I have question. a question. How does, you have, UN has- You have a question too. Yeah. 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 Well, the UN has a peacekeeping force to help you to assist them in, in, in their uh, legal issues, right? And they're going to enforce certain penalties. How does the ICC enforce the same penalties? Do they have their own? Uh, no, they have no no security. So force. then you can basically just they have to rely on nation states. So they can basically so the nation states leaders can actually ignore what they're doing and just continue on. Yeah. So that's what they're doing in Sudan. They can ignore it, or they can. Because uh, I was just reading about. Uh, reading, reading up on ICC, trying to get some more right. questions or whatever, but I was wondering, well, since they have no way of enforcing it, then why even bother having an institution all together? Well, that's the aspiration. Your argument, but why, why, are they, why would they have it? Like, why, I mean, that's, which is your argument? Like, why even bother? Why even bother having this institution since they have no way of enforcing their penalties? Um, well, they wanted to deal with the kind of situation that existed in World War II, so this is an attempt to start this argument would be, we're going to start this process, and we hope that countries will adhere. I mean, there are, it's possible. I mean, the United States currently is looking for Coney, right? And, uh, and there's, there's expeditionary forces with Uganda forces. They are looking for a war criminal, and they plan on turning them over to the ICC. So you do have, if they find um, this is the one that kidnaps children and so on. So there is, uh, and there's a leading NGO that's involved in this. So there is actually acting now. <coughs> Uh, I think it's Uganda and American for Special Forces that are looking for a war criminal. So in that case, there is a nation that's uh, hoping to round somebody up so that they would turn them over to the head. So they're hoping for more of this. So it is happening on a small scale, and uh, they're hoping for more of it. But uh, yeah, it, it's on a large scale, it's has, has Yeah, I was wondering, um, you said that uh, they, they classify aggression as um, any kind of force. And how do they justify PM to strike, you know, because you could just strike, even if you think they might attack you, but maybe not. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that would probably, that could be aggression. It's a very fuzzy area. Uh, like Israel's um, attack in 1967 was, was preempted because they knew it was coming. Uh, under Article 51 of the UN Charter, countries have the right of self-defense. Uh, and preemptive is considered a right of self-defense if they really know about it. Uh, under this Kampala conference I talked about, but the category of aggression has been expanded to mean anything. Blockade, commando raid, air raid, uh, bombardment. Uh, if it's a manifest violation, but, manifest, but it's not defined what a manifest is, so it's all very fuzzy. And that would be determined, what is, what is a crime of aggression then is determined by, not by the security cons, as it is today, under, <coughs> as it is under traditional but by the International Criminal Court. Well, that's, that's a problem. I have a yeah. question. Um, maybe to clarify sort of the argument. It seems to me kind of an implicit uh, premise here is that really a lot of what we observe 
uh, in international politics is just the normal pushing and shoving of nation states uh, and violence is often involved. Uh, it's hard to know who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. Sometimes they're both involved. Uh, that, uh, and really it's not that relevant anyway because it is after all an ongoing struggle for power and position. Uh, and so to criminalize that behavior is simply mistaken. It's just, uh, and then to turn it into a judicial process, when in fact what it is is the normal diplomatic, military, and intelligence activities of states is just uh, just a mistaken uh, idea at the outset. Is that kind of in line with what you're arguing? Yes, I think there are these, re I mean, there are, yes, that's, 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 that's more or less what I'm arguing. Now, the, I understand that there sometimes there is genocide or something like this, so we did have a murder trial. I didn't object to that. Um, uh, so there could be something but that really is a genocide or really is a crime against humanity. Everything they've come up with so far is not. Uh, these are you know, petty crimes or normal normal processes of, 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 of international politics and war. And as I say, um, I gave the example of even on trade, I would rather see a nation to nation than judicialize that process. I mean, the gap is working perfectly well. Uh, so I'm not sure that the IC, WTO, so far it's okay, but we have no way of knowing. And just to make this a little more difficult, let me go into domestic politics. The one which is also in my book, and this is something probably most people would be instinctively for. Uh, <clears throat> so in fact, today, as we're right at this hour, there's a hearing on Capitol Hill on the uh, the UN Disabled Treaty, the treaty to, uh, for the rights of the disabled, to protect the rights of the disabled. Uh, treaty, and so it's being debated in the US Senate, and there's, most people support it, there's some opposition to it, because they worry about, the opposition is worrying about interference in domestic politics, the leading group, and the homeschool group is particularly opposed because they think it interferes with the homeschool, the definition of disabled. There's no definition of disabled in the treaties in this. That's one problem. Problem is just treaties, they don't actually define the terms of the treaty. Rights of the disabled, but what is disabled? If you wear glasses, is that are you disabled? You know, under some you are under some circumstances, not. Uh, so there's a question about it, there's the mental issues of mental being mentally disabled. So there's a lot of dispute on actually what is what disabled, and then if if someone is disabled, um, some member of the family, then who should have the authority to make the decisions? There's a, a thesis called the best interest of the child, and that's disputed whether that means the family decides or the state decides. And what if the family is abusive? What if the state is overreaching? So there's all these uh, these issues, and, and this is uh, this is being debated now. But let me, let me switch to another domestic issue, which I talk a lot about in the book. Um, there's a UN uh, Women's Rights Treaty, uh, the CEDAW Treaty, it's called the CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And that was, uh, the treaty was developed in Beijing, China in 1994. Uh, so it was signed by the United States. It's never been ratified because there's a lot of opposition to the United States Senate. So um, it's signed by 180 countries in the world. We're gonna, uh, and then I'll talk about what's in the treaty in a minute. But let's say 180 countries signed the Women's Treaty. Um, countries that have not signed it are the United States, the Sudan, uh, Iran, and Syria. Saudi Arabia has signed the treaty. Since women don't drive, they're not permitted to drive. It's, they're not following the treaty, but they did sign it. They're not paying attention to it. Uh, but the United States, so the proponents of the treaty said, well, okay, the United States is a company with Iran, Syria, and Sudan. Great company. So this is where you want to be. Um, so what's, what's, the, what's the problem? opposition to the treaty. Well, in Washington, I had a long conversation <coughs> with the um, United Nations representative, a woman from Mauritius, which is off the coast of Africa. Uh, she was at, at part of one of these um, UN monitoring committees. If you sign a treaty, a human rights treaty, then the UN sends a committee to see how well you're doing. Are you following the treaty? So this is, so she was one of the wins for the women's treaty. She was going around the world, um, uh, <clears throat> monitoring countries. So I said, well, I read about uh, the cases, we, this is our conversation, it was at the American Society for International Law. 
I said, what? I, uh, what was, um, I said, I read about Slovenia, the case of Slovenia. I said, your committee criticized Slovenia violating women's rights because only 30% of Slovenia's children were in daycare centers. So he said, this was a violation of women's rights. So I said, explain, explain that to him. She said, yes, I remember the case. I was in Slovenia, I remember it very well. The problem was that a lot of women in Slovenia were not, this small number were not putting uh, children in daycare where they could get full educational opportunities, so they were missing out on the educational opportunities. And this was a result of the government policy. There was a sort of a debate in the election, and the Christian Democrats won. And their policy was, we're going to subsidize families, or we're going to give money to women to stay home. We're going to do this through family subsidizing. Uh, the other party was, let's promote daycares. So it was a political argument within a democracy. Um, and so the lady from the UN said, no, this is not, uh, I said, wasn't this a democratic political issue? You had one party, one side wanted to pay for the state on the other side, and then there might be some libertarians that don't want to pay for anything. Uh, this is not a political question. The democracies decide for themselves. She said, no, this is a matter of human rights, because uh, these uh, the children, these women are being deprived of, uh, of work opportunities, their children are being deprived of educational opportunities because they're not, there's better opportunities in the daycare than there would be at home. These people are not trained, they don't have the training, they can't do this, this sort of thing. So this is a violation of, uh, um, of women's rights as opposed to a question that democracies could decide themselves. Uh, so this was sort of, you know, sort of they, so the UN Monitoring Committee was essentially entering the political arena of a domestic country and putting its hand right on one side, putting tipping the scales on one side against the other side. They're making a, a political decision in this case. Uh, when they went to Great Britain, this is Britain under Tony Blair in the 1990s, fairly enlightened country for women's rights, better, yeah, better than Saudi Arabia probably, uh, probably doing pretty good. They said, no, you've got a problem here in Britain. We see you have this Parliament, you have this House of Commons, so you have 500 members, you have 40 are women, only 40. So that's under 10%, it's 9% or something. So why don't you have your 51% of the country women, why aren't 51% all members of Parliament women? Yeah, well, we have, we have elections, they have to be chosen by the party, and well, so this is not parity. And uh, the argument then in, in, uh, in the CEDAW treaty arrangement is, we are not interested, this is not a treaty about equality of opportunity. This is a treaty about substantive equality, equality of substance of process, or we could say parity. So that means if there are 50% of women in the country, then 50% 50, 50 of women should be in the parliament, even though it's an elected one. That would be that would be substantive equality. Quality of opportunity, we need to have a chance to run. So we're not we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know how this parliament is going to run up. I don't know if you've Talk about the theory of sort of traditional liberalism and political science. Liberalism is based on individual rights. The opposite of liberalism is, you know, say, corporatism, where you're put into a, a group you're born into. It's an ethnic group or a gender group. You're born into it, and therefore your representation is based on that. So they should be parliament. If you have 15 percent one ethnic group, it should be 15 percent member of the parliament. So that's a corporatist system. So that was founded actually. That was. By, by groups and by corporations, actually, Mussolini and Salazar and Franco are people that organize corporatism. It's not a standard liberal democracy because it's not liberal, it's illiberal. Liberalism is based on individual rights. So that's another problem. This is the CEDAW Treaty. So even in something that sounds great, Disabled Treaty, Human Rights Treaty, Rights of the Child Treaty, the United States, there's two countries in the world that have not recognized the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child. United States and Somalia. What's going on here? Again, you look at actually what's in the treaty. The United States takes the treaty seriously. The Europeans do not. They'll sign anything, they don't have to follow it. Saudi Arabia signs anything, it doesn't matter. The United States, we have a very litigious system. People like to bring lawsuits. You sign a treaty, it's the law of the land. By the Constitution, the treaty is the law of the land. That means you can bring a lawsuit. Okay, the treaty says this, you're not following that. The treaty says substantive equality, you're not doing substantive equality. That's a potential lawsuit. I'm not making this up. This is on the uh, look at the website of the American Bar Association. They have a book on their website. It's 200 pages of questions. If the United States would ratify the CEDAW Treaty, these are the questions they have to answer. They're all substantive quality questions. Women make up uh, percentage, percentage of, of the, as we just said. 
on the elected officials, what percentage here, what percentage of broadcast media and women, what percentage of the budget for the United States is spent on women's issues. Uh, so all of these would be questions that the UN Monitoring Committee would ask based on corporatism, substantive, uh, and this is part of global governance, and it's described as global governance, and it's described, the well, United States is a lag. The United States, remember Iran, Syria, Sudan didn't sign the Women Treaty, and the United States and Somalia not signing the Children's Treaty. What could possibly be wrong with the Children's Treaty? Well, one of the questions in there was, a child, let's say 10 years old, should have access to any material on the internet whatsoever the child chooses without the authority of the parents. So I would say it's potential for sexual predators and, and uh, or not, you know, whatever, a child at, uh, at 10. Uh, this could be interpreted to mean that, but that is in the treaty, so that's uh, the, one of the, some of the opposition says, well, we have to actually look what's in the treaty because um, as the United States, we're legally committed when we, when we ratify the treaty, and we, we actually take this stuff seriously and pay attention. So those are some of the more harder type of issues to explain. Um, then they're domestic politics, and they sound very bad in the beginning. Well, you know, they're not, you're opposed uh, they're with Somalia against this child's treaty, or, or uh, uh, against the women's treaty, or against the disabled treaty. Uh, and these are, these are domestic policy issues. But human rights treaties are sort of strange, right? That you don't, a normal treaty signed with Russia, they violate arms control, we build up arms control, and it's, it's tit for tat, we do this, we do that. We're not going to start, uh, Discriminating against women. Well, Saudi Arabia is discriminating against women, so they're not following the treaty, so we're not we're gonna retaliate and start discriminating ourselves. We don't do that in a human rights treaty. So it's it's more it's a convention, it's a promise to do certain things, which would be fine if you could determine uh, the process. And then I guess the other question is again, it's not enforceable though, right? The UN is not gonna send black helicopters. They're not gonna say you have to follow this treaty. So what's the enforcement? In the United States it's litigation. Uh, then they, of course, you could bring a suit, this is the treaty, and you're really not sure how a judge is going to interpret it. So we, since this country takes litigation seriously, more than any country in the world, uh, that would be the type of enforcement. And we usually do follow the judges, you know. we don't usually ignore them. Um, so, okay, I'll stop there, and do some other questions. I wanted to bring up something that's this year, just as great. So. We have 10 more minutes. We have a lot of written questions. Five. Okay, fine. Let's go. A couple of things to do. Let's get a question. You all got one written down. I can call on somebody. Brian, you volunteer. Well, I was just going to say, um, it seems like a lot of this is pretty arbitrary. It's uh, done on a case by case basis, like you said. Um, in the case of the uh, British Parliament, they didn't have 51% women. I mean, we're trying to figure out how, how to frame this into a question. Uh, What's 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 the end game here for them? What what do they expect? I guess what's going to happen in that specific case? Like, what are they going to do? How are they going to change that overnight? Or what are they going? What's their plan? Well, they have a long they, term. Well, I think they, that they, they. Yeah, that's a good question. They, that's what I was going to say. Are they just playing the long con? Are they like trying to more get moral victories right now and work up to it? Or well, what's the? That's a very good question. I think they have a long game, and this is sort of a utopian vision of how the world should be, and we're aiming in that direction. And in fact, they, this has happened in. Australia, this was for maternity leave. First Australia didn't have any paid maternity leave. And then they had it by the state. They said, okay, so the next visit, five years later, they said, okay, this is good, you're making progress. So they like to give, you know, you're making progress, to give encouragement. You're making progress, you've got it at the state level, now let's have it at the national level, which is, you know, and that's the next. And then in Germany, they have it at the national level. That's fine, that's good, except it's not, uh, you know, the, mater the, the parental leave, it's all the women are taking more. You know, men are fifty percent. So why aren't? What are you going to do to get fifty percent of the men? Because it's all women taking off from this maternity leave. So why don't we pay? Well, the men are choosing not to do this. So what are you doing? So the Germans said, "Well, we're doing some studies, working on this, trying to figure out how to get men to take parental leave." And this is, so they're spending their money, you know, working on this. Well, we're, we'll work on this. We're going to do some studies and get some incentives to have men do this, which you know might be fools in it, whatever. Um, but so that's how they respond. So usually that's, in that. and the United States signed the race treaty, uh, trade against racial discrimination, and we had monitors come here 
Uh, but the monitors went to see the, the they went to see the Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. People had particularly critics uh, of of U.S. policy, and, and again, the question of substantive quality came up. So, it's the percentages were not the same percentages of African Americans were not the percentage in Congress or in uh, in the medical profession. So these types of same questions of substantive quality, which is a key concept of the United Nations Human Rights Council, and it's followed. It was raised. And, and the goal is, yeah, the goal is expanding global, more and more global governance, more and more decisions, as they would see it, in a unified, global, integrated world, or an interdependent world, we're interdependent, we want to promote human rights, so this, is, this is how they would picture it. Yeah, it's a long game, I should, I should suggest. And that last point that you just made, it seems to me, is, is what makes this a compelling question, and that is uh, to refer back to international law as it was, say, immediately after World War II may not be pertinent in a very globalized, integrated world that we have today, and you know, where um, normative standards now are considered to be global, or not by everybody, but uh, you know, it's increasingly moving in that direction. Uh, and so even though the United States, for instance, doesn't sign all those human rights treaties, right. it will go out into public forums and say these rights ought to be respected. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, <clears throat> I think goes beyond just uh, lip service and actually to some extent implements. So uh, the global governance movement is to try to bring some order to this increasingly integrated globalized world that we're living in. Um, and so to go back to traditional diplomacy right. may not get the job done as far as uh, that's concerned. So how do you yeah, that would be there that that's their argument. Well, I guess I would look at uh, the experiences that it's not, the global governance project is not working very well at this point. They're not doing it. And I would then, since they don't have enforcement power, I'd rather rely on people that have enforcement power. The United States actually had an agreement with China and Russia on something, you know, that might hold, because you have some serious people, some serious power, you know, that it was an actual agreement on Iran or Syria or whatever. If you actually had some teeth to it, then you would actually have an ideal agreement. And that would be a form of global governance. It may be more traditional form of global governance. So, um, no, I think you're right. And also, as a dream, I think this issue is not going to die. I mean, historically, I mean, Dante talked about a world empire. Kant talked about a peaceful uh, uh, poem by uh, Ten, yeah, Tennyson. Tennyson. Tennyson's poem, uh, Parliament of Man. So this has been with. In fact, Alexander the Great, uh, his teacher was Aristotle, and they argued, if I say about global governance, Alexander, whose military was necessary to create this world empire, now there's peace, and uh, Aristotle preferred the uh, city state, the polis. So, this is an argument that's never going away. It's going to be going on for hundreds of years. Thank you, Brian.